Father, thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for your, your grace to us. Thank you for the, the children in our congregation and the children who participated in the, the fun uh, pumpkin decorating contest. And we pray that you've blessed them as, as they grow in you and as they grow uh, older and, and wiser and, and with more knowledge. Uh, we, we pray for those in our church who are sick or are uh, going through surgeries and, and the different medical conditions that they have. We pray for healing for them supernaturally. And we pray that through the, the natural methods, you give doctors wisdom and, and insight into how to proceed. And we, we pray that their bodies are, are healed and that they can make it through uh, these experiences and, and be stronger on the other side. We pray for those who are caregiving for those who are, are sick or those who have medical conditions. We pray that you strengthen them and help encourage them so that they have your love and your encouragement to share with those they're taking care of. And we pray for those who are in our church who are just on trips, good trips. We pray that for their safety and we pray that they have a good, uh, fun time and an enjoyable time uh, where they are as well. Um, so for us this morning, Lord, be with us as you as you speak to us through your word faithfully as you do each week and every time that we read your word. We pray for your spirit to minister to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you want to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We'll start in verse 31 and we'll go through verse 62. Verses 31 through 62 of Luke chapter 22. The title for our study is A Mount of Transgressions. A Mount of Transgressions. I remember going backpacking with a friend for his birthday in when I lived in Southern California. And, and it was like a February day, early February day. And in Southern California, it's sunny and nice all the time. So it was it was a nice, you know, warm day. It was probably like 75, 70, somewhere in there, right? And so we, we set off on this backpacking trip. Well, by the time we get to the top of the mountain at the end of the day when we're setting up camp, th there's snow everywhere at this point. So much snow that we couldn't even find our campsite that we were supposed to find. And we also couldn't make the peak of the mountain because the, the snow was too deep. So... So we couldn't climb all the way up. So we had to just find the best spot of ground that we could, kind of dig out the snow. And, and then it was starting to rain and rain and rain. So we set up our tent and we, we all got inside. And it's just pouring rain outside of our tent. And that's all fine and good for those who are prepared. But me, being overconfident, uh, didn't bring a sleeping bag, didn't bring a pillow, didn't bring very warm clothes at all. Uh, you know, I feel like I, I have this... It's Southern California. How bad could the weather be, you know? Uh, and so uh, on top of that, my side of the tent was, like, leaking all night, the rain. So I'm <laughs> I'm on the snow, the leaking rain on me. I'm, like, uh, just in my clothes. I have no sleeping bag. I'm using my backpack as a pillow, and, and I'm <laughs> trying to scoot away from the water more and more. On the other hand, my, my friend, he's prepared. You know, he's dry. He's got a warm sleeping bag. He's got a pillow. He's all set. And, and good to go. And so I, I learned my lesson from that experience to not only look at the weather at the bottom of the mountain, but look at the weather on the top of the mountain. But this morning we get to see a great example set by Jesus of how to spiritually prepare for what God has called us to do. Just as my friend did a good job preparing his, his sleeping bag and his pillow, Jesus does a great job spiritually preparing him for, uh, f for what he's about to accomplish. We also get to see a lack of spiritual preparation by the disciples that leads to avoidable challenges and avoidable stumbling blocks that they go through. So we get to see the good example of Jesus' spiritual preparation and the difficult example of the disciples who didn't follow the preparation that was set out before them. So we start in verses 31 through 46, seeing Jesus, the one who is righteous, as he is preparing his disciples and preparing himself. Let's read in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. 
But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, by now, he who has a money bag, let him take it and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, that he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, look, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So Jesus calls to Peter using Peter's pre-apostle birth name. Peter is born Simon, and Jesus, when Jesus called him to be an apostle, renamed him Peter. And, and this using, Jesus using Peter's pre-apostle name of Simon is, is previewing the limited faith that Peter is about to have. Now Jesus says that Satan is after Peter. Satan is going directly at Peter to test his faithfulness, to see if Peter will be faithful when put under pressure. This is a similar situation to what we see in Job chapter 1, when Satan is asking God if he can go after Job. Satan is going after Peter. Now, when uh, Jesus says that he is praying for Peter's faithfulness, for his faith to not fail, but when Peter does stumble later in the chapter, Peter should repent back to Jesus and help strengthen the other followers. That's Jesus' exhortation to him, that I'm praying for you, Peter, that your faith wouldn't fail. But if you stumble, repent back to me and then go and help strengthen your brothers, the brethren. Even in failure, Jesus' prayer works by empowering Peter's restoration afterwards. Now, Peter responds to what Jesus says here, uh, not taking notes on how Jesus is prepping him, but he responds to the contrary with a bold claim that he's going to follow Jesus no matter what. I'm ready to follow you to prison and to death, Jesus. Now, Jesus says that the rooster won't crow, morning won't come that evening. We won't get through the entire night before you deny me three times, Peter. Even after all of Peter's growth and all of his experience that we've seen throughout the book of Luke as he's growing as a disciple of Jesus, even after all of that strength and growth and experience, Peter still has a need for deeper faith in the Lord. And then Jesus turns to the rest of the apostles and reminds them of when he sent them out with no provisions. This reminds the apostles of how Jesus is able to provide for them out of nothing. In Luke chapter 9, and probably many other times in their ministry together on the earth, Jesus said, don't take anything with you. Just go out to some town, and God will provide for you as you minister to that town. There's no fast food. There's no in and out. There's no Motel 6. You're, you're just having to trust in the Lord that he's going to provide for you. And God did through that ministry. But Jesus goes on to tell them that now they should prepare money and belongings and swords for what is to come. Time is changing. Jesus quotes Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession, intercession for the transgressors. Obviously, Jesus pointing that passage, Isaiah 53, 12, at himself. Now, Jesus was able to provide for the apostles in this special way as they were ministering together on the earth. But this was just training for them so that they can learn how to minister before Jesus is to leave them physically from the earth and there to minister by the Spirit afterwards. Now, uh, the, the followers of Jesus must be prepared for the opposition that's coming their way. Just as Jesus will be persecuted as a transgressor, so 
the apostles, so Jesus' followers, his disciples, will be persecuted as well, just as Jesus was persecuted. So Jesus is uh, uh, changing the situation. He trained them with this special grace, this special provision as he walked with them on the earth. But now he's saying, now you can, you're ready to start preparing yourself for the transgressions, for the things or the things that are going to come against you, for, for the, the trials that you're going to face in ministry once Jesus is physically gone from the earth. So the disciples, they point out at this point, hey, we got two swords. Is that enough? For, is that enough preparation? And, and Jesus, uh, uh, I mean, of course, they're not fully grasping uh, what Jesus is trying to say here. So Jesus at this point just kind of ends the discussion and is patient to wait for them to have a full understanding of this later down the road after Jesus raises from the dead. They kind of get this preparation concept. But Jesus here in this passage first sees the challenges and the need for faith that Peter and the apostles will need as they go forward through their ministry. And Jesus has done well preparing them for ministry as he's walked with them on earth. And he gives them these final words for preparation that we're reading right here. And even though they mostly miss Jesus' warning here in this passage, it will help them in years to come when they do get it. After Jesus raises from the dead and this stuff starts clicking, these words of encouragement, these words of preparation that Jesus gives them end up helping them through their ministries after Jesus is gone, as we see in the book of Acts and in the letters of the epistles through the New Testament, and as we learn from these letters as well. Now, like the apostles, as followers of Jesus, we're also being prepared for a life of ministry to the Lord. Now, hear that. We're being prepared, all of us, for a life of ministry to the Lord, just like the apostles were being prepared for a life of ministry. But also like the apostles, we tend to miss what God speaks to us through his word as preparation. When we're reading through scripture and, and like, what, like what we're doing right now or what you do at home, that's the Lord ministering to us and preparing us for this ministry. And we, we often miss the things God speaks to us. The apostles might be here counting their physical swords instead of counting their weapons of faith. For us, we might be counting the resources that matter to us in this world instead of uh, counting the strength of faith that we, that we need in our life uh, to live ministering to God as, as living sacrifices. Our lives as living sacrifices to God. If we care more about our earthly lives or if we care more about our earthly possessions, we will miss the daily callings and the daily growth that God has for us. To illustrate this point, if you were, if you were preparing a bag for a natural disaster or for a zombie apocalypse or something like that, um, would you put in that bag, would you put water and food and, and weapons to pr protect yourself? Or would you put like your iPad and your, your TV, strap that on your back somehow, and your, f your best clothes, like your, your favorite clothes and the nicest clothes that you have? You know, which, which thing would you fill up your bag with? And, y and you can see how I could make the mistake of hiking without a sleeping bag and pillow because uh, when the first couple times that I went – backpacking by myself or not by myself but the without any help from someone who's more experienced um, I I packed a whole bunch of clothes and a whole bunch of heavy things and not enough water and food and then I spend like the second half of the trip rationing sips of water and, and bites of food and just you know hurting and thirst my back aching from all the weight of the, all the clothes and stuff that I brought that I didn't ever use so later on you know I'm not packing anything anymore but food and water so that I don't run out of food and water, make the opposite mistake. But yeah, it, you're preparing for a zombie apocalypse. You're preparing for uh, a backpacking trip. It's basically the same thing. Are you, provi are you putting in there, are you prepping with the things that are needed and necessary, the food, the water, the things that sustain you, or are you prepping with things that are just going to weigh down your backpack and make you thirsty and hungry later on? For us in our spiritual life, we want to let the Lord prepare us for the work that he wants to do in our life. And this is both spiritual and physical preparation. That in our life, our own 
household finances, our own household resources, our jobs, our uh, the way we structure our, our calendar, those things, putting those in order, so that we're ready for the God to ready for God to call us to whatever He's going to call us to at any point, and we're ready to use those resources for the Lord at any point. And then spiritually, putting our hearts into order and focused on the Lord, so that so that our hearts are ready for God to call us and move us to anything that we can do at any point. Jesus is saying, "I I was with you, apostles, and I gave you a special preparation, but now you're ready to to take part in this preparation yourself." You're ready to prepare with physical things like money and swords. You're, you're also ready to prepare spiritually. And for us, we're learning from this entire encounter. We get to skip the first part and go straight to the prepare the physical things in our lives for God to use for his purposes and his ministry and prepare us spiritually our hearts for God to use for his ministry and purposes. That brings us to verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he had come to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow, and he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter temptation. So Jesus and the apostles they head back, you know, they had previously been at someone's house uh, taking the Passover supper together, and they took what we call now being the first communion together, the, the Lord's Supper together, and they were having these conversations. So now they head back out to the Mount of Olives where they went every night to sleep while they were in Jerusalem. They'd go into Jerusalem. Jesus would teach at the temple and then every night they'd go back out to the Mount of Olives but this time instead of going to sleep Jesus instructs the apostles to stay up and pray against temptation instead of sleeping stay up and pray against temptation just as Jesus has to prepare for the cross the apostles need to prepare to avoid rejecting Jesus while he's while Jesus is going through the sufferings of the cross now, Jesus separates himself from the group to have private prayer time with God the Father. And Jesus famously prays to not have to go to the cross, but for God's will to be accomplished more or over his own. Jesus is prioritizing God's will over his own desires before and after this, this request that he has to not go to the cross. But the suffering and the weight of sin, the sin of the world that he will have to bear on the cross, and the pain of the suffering of the cross, that all that pain and suffering and weight, all that is real pain and real suffering and real weight. And Jesus honestly asked God for any other way to save humanity. He's not avoiding the cross or avoiding what God wants him to do, but he's saying, if there's another way to save humanity other than this one, can we take that path? Because this path is tough. This path is painful. Now, we might wonder why Jesus is asking God to avoid the cross if Jesus is God. And, and we've seen throughout the book of Luke that Luke highlights Jesus' humanity. Jesus has both a human and a divine nature. Jesus is God, but he subjects himself to human experience through the incarnation. And, and so he also, even though he is God, he's still experiencing these human experiences and feelings and, and seeing the suffering that's going to have to take place. And he's fully experiencing that suffering and that pain, or he will fully experience that suffering and that pain. So, so Jesus truly feels the suffering of this moment, and he truly does not want the suffering. 
He, he truly does not want to experience it, just like any of us would never want to experience that. But Jesus, this is key, Jesus prioritizes God's will. Jesus prioritizes what is best for the world over his own desires. Even though Jesus doesn't want to experience this pain, he's prioritizing God's will. Nevertheless, God's will, nevertheless, your will be done, God. He's prioritizing God's will and what's best for the world over his own desires. Now, God sends an angel to strengthen Jesus. Jesus' human nature needs strength, just like our human natures need strength. And despite this strength, even with this strength, Jesus is in agony over what's to come. He's in so much agony that he's sweating like drops of blood. At this low and painful point, Jesus prays more and more to the Lord. And as Jesus is more and more crying out to God, more and more in agony of what's to come, God's mind doesn't change on the topic. That This is the only option. And Jesus continues to pray more and more with no mind change of God. Now Jesus finishes praying and then he goes back to his disciples to find them asleep. They're, they're overcome by the emotions of the situation. They're overcome by not fully understanding what's about to happen, but kind of getting at this point that Jesus is about to suffer. Peter kind of gives us that insight. They're kind of seeing that there's prison and death on the horizon. Jesus has prophesied it about, about it enough times by now, but they're kind of getting that, and they're overcome by emotions, and they're, they've fallen asleep. And Jesus wakes them up and encourages them to keep praying against temptation. What is most important in this moment, disciples, is not that you sleep for comfort, that you, but that you pray against the temptation that's about to come to you. Now, Jesus is faced with an extremely difficult situation that God is calling him to. And Jesus' response to this difficult situation is to devote himself to prayer. He's expressing his feelings and his desires to God, but at the same time, he's admitting submission to God. And he's receiving strength from God, all in this passionate plea and passionate prayer to the Lord. The apostles, however, in contrast, are too overcome by emotions to devote themselves to prayer. And we'll get to see how these two different approaches, Jesus' devotion to prayer and the apostles being too overcome by emotions to devote themselves to prayer, we see how these two different approaches uh, manifest in Jesus' success and the apostles' failure of faith in the trials that are to come. I remember... uh, in, in high school, I got into this habit of every day when I was when I was walking to school, spending that time praying and and worshiping the Lord. And this habit that started way back in high school kind of carried with me as I started to go to, to, to college and then I started to go to, to work when I'm biking to work or riding the train to work or driving to work. You know, I'm praying and worshiping the Lord to pre- prepare for my day. The whole idea in high school was... Uh, that I need the Lord to prepare to get me through that day and to be a good witness to other kids and teachers in high school. And that carried into college, and that carried into my my work, and that carries with me still to this day driving to the church. Whenever I come to the church, I'm I'm praying and and, and praying for the Lord to prepare me for that. And and I'm not going to claim, it would be an exaggeration to claim that every time I... I remember to pray that day that everything goes perfect and everything's great and the Lord has strengthened me and, and I'm invincible that day. You know, that's an exaggeration. But when I look back through all of these years of having this habit, that the, the, it is abundantly clear how much that, that time of prayer before these daily important events in my life, how much that has strengthened and prepared me and ministered to me and how much that has affected and influenced my life how much that's affected and influenced my time in high school and in college and at work and here at the church it's uh, as we look back and and comparing that to the times when i missed the prayer in the morning again and it's an exaggeration to say that those days just went terrible because i missed prayer that morning but also looking back throughout the years i can see when i'm not devoting myself to prayer to the lord to prepare for my life, my daily life, then then I, I'm weakened and I'm not prepared spiritually for the Lord. 
Now, I do want to highlight another important aspect of Jesus' example here. In addition to his preparation, being devoted to prayer to God, his prayer, Jesus' prayer, is extremely honest and extremely real. So, so, so extremely honest and real, it makes us a little uncomfortable how honest and real Jesus is being in prayer right here. He's not putting on any fake happy face for God. He's being painfully honest about where he's at while at the same time still submitting to God and still showing reverence and respect and worship to God at the same time. Think of some of the most powerful times of prayer in my life have been when I've been extremely depressed. Throughout my life, I've had different moments of depression that just cloud my mind and, and just weigh me down. And, and uh, it's nothing that you c- I can easily pop out of. And spending those moments expressing my thoughts and my feelings to the Lord, uh, not necessarily happy, uh, upset, just sad, hopeless, or frustrated, any of those motions at any given time, expressing that to the Lord and uh, expressing how I feel and discussing with God about what he thinks and feels about what I'm thinking and feeling and talking to him about how I think certain things should be different or I wish they were different or or I know they never will be different, you know, no hope kind of thoughts and, and letting the Lord work through that with me those moments in in those depression times that eat at my mind those are some of the most impactful most changing most shaping most amazing moments with the lord but in those moments i can just honestly express those things to god now as believers our experience of christianity cannot be some fake everything's perfect facade thing that we put up. That things are great, I'm a Christian, everything's perfect. We need to live out the realest and the deepest parts of our souls with God and with others. And the reason why we need to to live out the deepest parts of our souls with God and others is so that we aren't imprisoned by our own ways of coping with those things. If we try to handle this stuff on our own, if we're putting up this fake Christian facade, uh, it'll it'll end up just be some fake form of coping that will imprison us and, and trap us and keep us in the the real emotions and the real things that we're feeling and thinking. Our faith and our relationship with the Lord is supposed to be the most real thing that we have and the most real thing that we experience. So we need to be completely honest and open with the Lord and work through those things with God. All right, that brings us to verse 47, and we see Jesus being given up, Jesus the righteous one being given up for those who are unrighteous. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he was... He who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to them, to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the darkness and the power of darkness. Now, in the middle of uh, this conversation about prayer and temptation with the apostles, a large group of soldiers, we learn from other Gospels' accounts, appear. 
And the apostle Judas Iscariot gets up to kiss Jesus so that Jesus can be identified in the dark by this crowd of soldiers. Now, Jesus cleverly points out that Judas, one of his chosen apostles, is betraying the Messiah with a kiss. The irony of this passage is thick, that Jesus' friend betrays him with an act of friendship. The apostles rise up, ready to fight. After all, Jesus had told them to pack swords, right? So it's <laughs> for this moment. They're, they're misunderstanding of Jesus' preparation request. They're ready to fight. And one of the apostles, Peter, we learn from another gospel, uh, cuts the high priest servant's ear off before Jesus is able to stop him, before they wait for Jesus' response of whether they should attack or not. Jesus, Peter jumps in and cuts the servant of the high priest's ear off. Now this, the ear being cut off, would disqualify the servant from priestly ministry, from his job that he's supposed to be doing. And it would bring large shame on the high priest himself. So, so this, is a, uh, this is a rough thing to do to one of the servants of the high priest. But Jesus commands the apostles to allow him to be arrested, to not fight back. And Jesus actually heals the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus is submitting to God's will here. Remember, he was just praying to avoid this. But he's submitting to the will of God while the disciples are still trying to fight the will of God because they're not prepared in prayer. And Jesus is ironically healing the very enemy who is trying to kill him. Well, Jesus turns to the Jewish leaders and questions the method that they have come to get them. He questions their honesty about this arrest. They come with weapons as if Jesus was just some common criminal that they were going to fight off and they needed to come as if Jesus was going to fight back, uh, as if they didn't know who Jesus was already. And they come at night instead of coming in, in the public at the temple where every day he's going to the temple, right in public, in the, in the daytime where everybody can see. But they come at night so that nobody can see this event happen so they don't have to worry about the crowd. So Jesus is questioning the honesty of this arrest. Now, what is obvious throughout this scene is how in control God and Jesus are of this situation, even though it seems like the Jewish leaders should be the ones in control here. They're the ones, it's the sneak attack. They're the ones who are, who are uh, trying to get the surprise attack here. They're the ones with the big group, the big group of soldiers coming to arrest. They should be the ones in control, but it's clear that God and Jesus are actually the ones in control here. We had um, we had groceries delivered to our house a, a few weeks ago, and the lady who was delivering the groceries, I don't know if you've used one of these apps before, but they like you like pick out what you want from the store and they shop for you and bring it back. So she she did a terrible job. She like picked out all the wrong stuff. She like skipped a bunch of stuff and just said, "No, I'm not going to grab that." Um, she I think if I remember correctly, she she got us like something that was like broken or expired or something as well. And she she took a long time and, and uh, it just it was it was not good. So my my immediate response was like, all right, because Morgan runs the app. So I was like, all right, Morgan, you got to give her the worst review possible. You got to complain to the company, ask for a refund, like make sure that, you know, she's not doing this to anybody else. And like make sure, you know, we get back at her for all this stuff. And uh, then, you know, I walk out of the room and I'm walking out of the room and I'm like, oh, it hits me like. Uh, so I turn back and I'm like, on second thought, Morgan, <laughs> none of that. Just give her, you know, a decent enough review and give her a tip. You know, I'd said, don't, don't tip her, you know, like, uh, because I realized that in that moment, uh, I was out for retribution. I was out to make her suffer for the minor inconvenience <laughs> that she gave me. And uh, th that's not my place here to, to come and give her payback for something that was so s it's not that big of a deal really um, to ruin her day to take food off her table and, and try to get her in trouble uh, for uh, for such a minor inconvenience so I had to turn back to Morgan and be like never mind never mind never mind you just do your normal thing and, and we'll just let it go um, 
though Christians, we, we often do a, a great job of fighting for true justice and true righteousness in our society, our main priority is not those things. Our main priority is submitting to the will of God. There's going to be plenty of times when submitting to God's will seems unfair or seems not how it should be. But the reason why we can have full peace in this approach, in, in the approach of our goal is not seeking for retribution and seeking to, to make people pay, our goal is to follow God's will. The reason why we have full peace in this approach is that even when it seems like bad people or bad ideas are in control and are getting the upper hand, in reality, we know God is actually in control and God actually has the, op the upper hand, even when it seems like that's not the case. And that wipes the slate clean for us. It's no longer us seeking for retribution. It's seeking what is God's will in this situation. And, and often that's... Uh, that's supporting people who uh, can't protect themselves and, and getting justice for people or protecting people that are underprotected. But uh, often that's us uh, putting ourselves uh, second and letting bad things happen to us so that uh, the, the, the main thing stays the main thing. The main thing is the gospel of Jesus reaching this world and the love of Jesus reaching this world. So we're not getting distracted by our own flesh and motives. Let's read in verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And then after about an hour passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. It breaks my heart every time I read this. So Jesus lets the Jewish leaders, and, and hear that, Jesus lets the Jewish leaders arrest him and take him to the high priest's house for questioning. And Peter follows at a distance and tries to blend in with the crowd in the courtyard of the house. Remember, Peter had just tried to defend Jesus, pulling out the sword and striking. So now that Jesus told him not to, not to cut anybody's ears off anymore, so now he's laying low. He's trying not to be seen. He's following in the crowd. Now, unfortunately for Peter, a servant girl recognizes him and points out, hey, this guy was with Jesus. So Peter, he's trying to stay undercover. He said, woman, I don't, I don't know that guy. I don't know what you're talking about. A little while later, a man recognizes Peter as one of the people who are following Jesus, one of Jesus' followers. And again, Peter's trying to keep his cover, and he says, that ain't me. Man, I'm not that one. Another hour later, another person points out that Peter is Galilean, probably from his accent they figured it out. And so that he has to be with Jesus, because why would a Galilean be around here? Peter sticks to the script and says, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. At that very moment, the rooster crows, and Jesus turns from wherever he was being questioning and looks at Peter. And this reminds Peter of, of when Jesus predicted that he would deny him. And this reminds Peter of the confidence that he had a few hours ago to say that he was going to follow Jesus to arrest or to death. And Peter leaves, 
in Christ. He's overcome with what's happened. and He's overcome with how he has failed. See, Jesus has called to Peter. God's will for Peter wasn't to fight. That wasn't the goal. This isn't the time to fight who's coming. But Jesus' call to Peter and God's will for Peter also was to still avoid the temptation of denying him. Don't fight these people, but don't deny me either, Peter. How easy is it for us to miss the mark that God has set before us? Peter's trying to figure out how to be faithful, but without the preparation necessary for that. He didn't have the preparation of hearing and understanding Jesus' words to him before. And he didn't have the preparation of seeking God's strength in prayer all night long as Jesus was seeking God's strength in prayer. So So Peter finds himself denying Jesus. Luckily, Jesus had given Peter and had given us the answer of where to go from here in verse 32. Where do we go when we didn't listen to God's preparation through his word? Where do we go when we didn't seek the Lord in prayer, devote ourselves to prayer to be prepared? Well, first, Jesus says in verse 32, we repent. Peter, repent. We immediately turn back to Jesus. This is so hard to do because we're so upset about failing. We're either trying to hide it or, or heaping on guilt onto ourselves, and we stop ourselves from repenting to the Lord. Jesus says, don't, don't do that. Don't hide it. Don't, don't heap on guilt onto yourself. Repent. Turn back to Jesus immediately. Second thing is that once we are restored, then we can go help others and help strengthen others and help encourage others as well. Now that we've experienced this ourselves, we finally heard the preparation from God. We finally learned our lesson. We saw what happens when we did it wrong. We turn back to God immediately. And now that we're restored, now that we're re-strengthened, now we can encourage others to do the same and encourage others to not make the same mistake that we have made. Now, there's two encourages us for two encourages for us this morning. First is just that 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 when when and if If you're living in a mistake right now because you didn't prepare with the Lord, you didn't hear his word, and you didn't devote yourself to prayer, so you're dealing with a mistake this morning, Jesus gives us the answer to those things. Immediately turn back right now, repent, just turn back to Jesus. Easy peasy. Burden is light here. Easy. We just turn back to Jesus. Forget about the guilt. Forget about the shame. Forget about hiding. Turn back to Jesus. And then from there, help encourage the rest of us with what God has done in your life, how God has restored you in his life. That's one thing. But second thing, the second encouragement for us this morning is is uh, before we get to that point where we haven't prepared, let us prepare. Let's seek the Lord's words through his word, and let's devote ourselves to prayer so that God can prepare us physically and spiritually prepare us with the resources he's given us in our lives, and prepare us in our hearts for the ministry that he has planned for us. So if we've fallen, let's repent, and and, and let's help strengthen others. But before we get to the point where we fall, before we get to the point where we trip, let us prepare by seeking his word and prepare by devoting ourselves to prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are devoting ourselves to prayer right this second and to hearing your words right this second. You're faithful to speak to us through your word and you're faithful to answer our prayers. We thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to commune with you, to have fellowship with you, this opportunity that's only possible because of what Jesus has done here, the suffering that he went through, the way that he prepared in prayer, and by listening to you. We want to follow that example, Lord. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus for salvation. You've never believed in the death or resurrection of Jesus. You've never believed that he can forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life if you trust in him, if you give your life to him. You've never actually given over your life to Jesus. 
you're here and you would like to give your life to Jesus for the first time this morning, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray with you. Does anybody want to give their lives to Jesus for the first time this morning? Those of you who are raising your hands online, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these who are choosing to trust you, choosing for their lives to be transformed. I pray that, pray that they believe in your death and your resurrection, your ability to forgive them of their sins. Pray that they ask you for this gift and that you grant it to them, that they have eternal life in you, Lord, from this day forward. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer, if you are here this morning, you've already trusted Jesus. You're already a follower of Jesus. The Lord has encouraged you on one of those two points, either because you failed to prepare and now God is calling you to repent and then to help strengthen others, or because God definitely has something coming for you that you don't know, you might not even, you probably don't even know what it is, but you know that the Lord is calling you to prepare spiritually by seeking him and his word and by devoting yourself to prayer. And you feel God's call to devote you to prayer. You, you hear him saying, devote yourself to prayer, devote yourself to my word. If one of those things applies to you, I'd love to pray for you if you want to raise your hand. Amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Anybody else want to be included in this prayer? Amen, amen. Father, I thank you for these and for those who are raising their hands online. I thank you for how clear you are to speak to us thank you for the encouragement to repent to you and feeling your grace how there's no weight that that you can't bear there's nothing that you can't forgive us as forgive us from and put us on the right track and lord thank you for the encouragement to devote ourselves to you to be prepared devote ourselves to praying earnestly honestly no show our real feelings and emotions really what's going on and, and then listening to how you prepare us through prayer and through your word God, I pray that you uh, give a, a supernatural encouragement and ability to those who are raising their hands today for this. For all of us, Lord, we, we uh, love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.